My name is Jose Rodriguez, if you have never seen me up here. And me and my wife have the honor and pleasure of serving in that church as the family pastors. Yes, thank you, Lord. It is seriously the mercy of God and the patience of Donnie and Brianna over us <laughs> to believe that we were even somehow equipped to do such a thing. But it's our honor, seriously. And it's our honor, honor to serve our church, to serve under Donnie and Brianna. They're great pastors, they're great people. And we love you guys. You are awesome. Thank you for trusting in us and believing in us. But seriously, thank you so much for being here this morning. It is great, and I'm very excited about what God is doing in our church in this season. Amen. I don't know you guys, but like every ministry zone is growing. It's growing stronger. It's growing deeper. Young adults are blooming in a crazy way. Where's TJ? Oh, see, he, he's in kids today. He is doing such an amazing job. Our families are getting to know each other, getting closer to each other. We see God move in the midst in a way that we haven't, and it's amazing and encouraging. And now we're entering into this season of cool weather, and things are getting nice, and now we're looking forward to the holidays and the food and Thanksgiving, and then it is really easy to just chill and coast until the end of the year. And I don't know about you guys, but I want more. The year is not over. The promises of God are still there, and I'm still believing that He can do something in the midst of my circumstances. The year is not over, guys. It feels nice and cool, and, and Christmas is almost there, but God can still do something of the things that He had spoken to you about. And that is something I want to speak to you guys this morning about. We're in this new series, and, and I've been enjoying it a lot. I don't know if you guys, but we are in this series called A People After God's Heart. I want to be that. I want to be a person that represents God everywhere I go. That when people see me, they say, they look, he looks like Jesus. He acts like Jesus. He speaks like Jesus. He moves like Jesus. I want to be a person like that. And Donnie started this series two weeks ago. And the first week he spoke about, like he gave us a little overview of the book of Psalms. If you remember that, he did a great job encouraging us that it is important. And we're like trees planted next to the waters when we meditate in his word, when we find the light in his word. And his word is also the book of Psalms. In the second weekend, he spoke about the power of confession and the power of repentance as we confess our sin. And how David was led to write that psalm, Psalm 51. And he's, it's a declaration of his heart pouring out his confession of the sin that he had just done. He also mentioned that every revival in history, every single move of the Spirit was centered and, and rooted in repentance and confession. That's how important it is. We want to see God moving in our city. I want to see Battle Rouge moving in a crazy way. That not just the, the Mississippi River flows in here, but the river of the Spirit flows in a crazy way. I want to see that happening. I don't know, you guys. But I want to believe for that. But today, oh, I lost him. There he is. Today, I'm going to talk to you guys about Psalm 27. It is a very powerful declaration of David. But you really need to understand what the circumstances were, or what was actually happening for David to write down that song. If you remember, David had been anointed as the future king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. Yet he was not the king, but he was doing an amazing job following Saul and obeying everything Saul was asking him to do. Saul was the king of Israel at that point. And he was prospering so much and he was doing so well in every battle and winning things for the kingdom of Israel that Saul became jealous. David's fame started to increase in a crazy way and Saul saw that every day, little by little, God was taking him towards the kingdom to become the king. And he didn't like that. So he decided in his heart to take action and kill David. And because of that, David had to flee. 
without even being able to grab anything, provisions or anything like that, in the middle of the night, he escapes and he has to leave behind his wife. Just think about that. His friends, his best friend, Jonathan, whom he loved deeply, says the Bible. All the life he knew about had to leave behind. In the midst of that and him fleeing, he comes to a priest, priest, Ahimelech the priest. And he asks him for something to eat, a piece of bread and a sword because in the hurry he didn't, he wasn't able to get anything with him. But then one servant of Saul saw him as he was speaking to the priest. Not a good thing. So he ended up going and moving to a land that was, that was not his own to live in the midst of the Philistines, his own enemies. But his fame was so great already that people were singing, Dave killed his, I'm sorry, Saul killed his thousands, but David kills his ten thousands. And the king and the soldiers started questioning each other, isn't it David, the one that is actually killing us by ten thousands? What is he even doing here? And before the king decided to kill him, David had to act and pretend that he was crazy. So he started just moving crazy and doing crazy things and letting all this saliva come out of his mouth. And the king was just laughing and said, do I need another clown? Take this clown out of my presence. From there, he went to the cave of Adullam, if you have heard that before. Beautiful place in the Bible. Not in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God. Because every person that was broken in the midst of distress, people that nobody wanted to have around in any way, were the ones that came and joined him in that place, the cave of Adullam, about 400 people. And him being away in a land that was not his land, on top of that, his family heard that he was there. And would you would think, oh, how pretty his family is going to come and be with him again and start talking to each other. Oh, daddy, I miss you. Mommy, I miss you. All that stuff. It was not the type of family reunion you would think. Because they also were being chased by Saul to be killed. So what I picture is them coming to tell David, what in the world were you thinking? They're about to kill us also because of you. What did you do? What are we going to do? We have to leave everything behind because of you. David had to take his family to the only safe place they probably knew, which was Moab, another city, another nation, where probably they were going to be protected because if King Saul was trying to send an army to kill them, they would respond with another army. So it was the perfect place. And if you remember, Ruth, David's great-grandma, was a Moabite. So most likely there were some family ties in there and they were like, that's the best place to go. So David took him over there and had to abandon them. I, I, I don't think that was the case. I think they didn't even want to be with David anymore. So it was a pretty sad circumstance and situation that he was dealing with. The most important man in the kingdom wanted to kill him, the king Saul. He had to leave his family and everything he knew about his life. And on top of that, the servant of Saul that had seen him fleeing went to Saul and told him what the priest had done for David. And Saul ended up killing 80 of the priests of the Lord. And one person came and told David that. David loved the Lord and of course he loved the priest. Can you imagine caring with that guilt in his heart? Yet this was his declaration. And this is what I want to read with you guys this morning. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may arise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And I'm going to jump from there to verse number 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What a bold declaration for a man that has all the weight of the world in his shoulders at that point. Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That was the only thing he found to hold on together. Because everything most likely was falling apart in his life. You know, when in time of affliction, like this one, when we see no end of our circumstance, no way out in any possible way, when there is absolutely nothing we can do about our circumstances, if there is still one little tiny grain of illusion and expectation that God can still do something, that is called hope. That is called hope. You know, one day, uh, John Wesley, if you have heard of John Wesley, one of the greatest reformers if they, in the 1800s, he uh, had just heard about the whole thing of uh, Martin Luther, and he read all his, his, his things that he had written and all that stuff, and he was now believing that uh, salvation was by faith alone. And because of that, and because of his enthusiasm, the churches of the time would not let him allow to preach inside of those churches. Definitely not a season I would have liked to be. He was an enthusiastic preacher. And he was preaching, hey, it is by faith alone, not by works. So because of that, he had to go outdoors. And he went to the people, that, the, the unchurched people. The people that were not allowed to go to churches because of the way they were looking like or because of their circumstances or because of their status. So that day he was preaching outdoors and he was looking at, at, his, at the congregation he was addressing and he, look, he looked at this man that was very low, troubled in his, in his face, in his countenance. Totally a person that you had said he lost his hope. And as he was looking at him, he also saw that right next to him, there was a fence made out of a stone. And right next to the fence, there was a cow that was curious and had come to just look and see what was happening in the, in the meeting that they were having. And the cow was lifting up her head, just trying to see what these people were about. And John Wesley looked at him, at this, this guy that was low and sad, and he said, do you see that cow? Do you understand what she's doing, what she's doing? Because she cannot see through that wall. And so are your afflictions. You can see through them. But if you lift up your eyes just a little bit and see beyond those afflictions, there is the one that has an answer for all your troubles. There is the one that can change your circumstances when nobody else can. Hallelujah. That is the God we have. So I came this morning, guys, to tell you, hope is not faking that there is no issues. It's not about that. There are issues, and there will always be afflictions. Jesus said so. In this world, you will face many afflictions. It is in the Bible. So it's not about denying that they exist. But hope is the confidence that those will not be eternal. That the pain and the sorrow and the things that we have inside can and will be healed. Because that is the God who loves us and can transform every single one of your circumstances. Hope is not about faking. My calling this morning to the one that is here today and say, man, I don't see an answer. Don't lose your hope. 
Don't lose your hope. Hope is the only thing that a Christian should never lose. It's the only thing that holds us together. Martin Luther said it this way, and if you want to pull it up, he said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Afflictions and disappointments are temporary, but our hope in God remains forever because he can do something in every circumstance. Thank you, Jesus. If you knew the story of Job in the Bible, you would understand that the only thing we can never lose, we should never lose as a Christian, is our hope. Job in one day, one day, lost all of his children. A servant ran, ran to his presence and told him, all your kids are dead. The same very day, another servant ran to him and told him, Job, you just lost everything you had. The cattle, the plantations, all that was yours was burned and you had just lost it. If that wasn't enough, days after, he lost his good health. And the Bible says that his body was full of boils all over from head to toe. And other translation says that his body was like one soul boil. That's how bad it was. That he was trying to find something to try to scratch himself because he was miserable. And because of that, he lost his good name and reputation before his closest friends. And if that wasn't enough, he lost the little respect that his wife had still over him. To the point that she came and told him, curse God and die. His own wife. But there, in the midst of that circumstance, when nothing was clear, when everything was horrible, he lifted up his eyes and said, even if he kills me, I will still hope in the Lord. Because the only thing we cannot lose is our hope. Hope is what holds us together in the midst of affliction. The second, uh, I'm sorry, the book of Esther in the Bible. If you haven't read that story, you need to read that story. You know, interesting, interestingly speaking, interestingly enough, it is the only book in the Bible that does not mention the name of God or says God everywhere, anywhere. But everything in that situation and the whole story is about God. And it's about his power. And it's about what he can do in the midst of hard circumstances. What happened at that point was that the second man in command, Israel was captive under the, the kingdom of Persia and, and Mede. And in the midst of that circumstance, the second man in command came to the king and somehow convinced him to sign a decree to be able to destroy all the Jews in the nation in one day. All of them. So the sentence was just not any sentence. It was a death sentence. And when that happened, Mordecai, another servant of the, of the king at that point, a Jew, came to Queen Esther, his niece, whom he had raised from when she was a little girl and actually set it up to become the queen, and said, Esther, if you do not intercede for us right now, we are all going to die. But she was afraid, like anyone would, and said, I can't come to the king. If I come to the king, I will be killed. Nobody can come to the king unless the king invites them into his presence. And if I go in there, he is going to kill me. But in the midst of that circumstance, in the midst of an irrevocable decree, because that's what it was, in the kingdom of Middle Persia, those decrees were irrevocable. Nobody was able to change them. In the midst of that, Mordecai looked at Esther and said, listen, and this is what he said. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews for another place. 
but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time like this. In other words, it doesn't matter if what's in front of us is an irrevocable decree. It could have been a diagnosis from the doctor saying there is absolutely nothing to do in your condition. Something that nothing and no one can change. Maybe the person, the only person that is allowed to help you is not willing to do so. It's still God can do something. And that's exactly what Mordecai declared. He said, if you don't help me, relief and deliverance will come from somewhere else. Because that is the God we believe in. That is the God that is in charge of your life and protecting everything you do. Thank you, Lord. Hope is something that we cannot lose. It's the only thing we should never lose. It doesn't matter how hard the circumstance is. Hope is what holds us together. We see also in the Bible the life of Abraham. And this one absolutely blows my mind. Paul, speaking of Abraham, said that Abraham believed with hope against all hope. If you think about it, the only thing that he had in his hand was a promise from God. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Everything else, all the odds were against him. The Bible says that his body was as good as dead because he he was over 100 years old. And not just that, but his wife had been barren her entire life and now almost 90, which means that biologically speaking, there was no way for her to conceive. And not just that, but there was absolutely no way for her to carry a baby for nine months. Ask a pregnant lady today. No way. All the odds were against him. But Abraham believed with hope against all hope to the point that was embarrassing. God changed his name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means father of multitudes or or father of many nations. And not just his name, but his wife's name too. Her name was Sarai, which means princess, and was changed to Sarah, which means mother of multitudes or, or mother of many nations. So just try to picture this with me. Abraham believing with hope against all hope to the point that was super embarrassing. Try to picture the old couple. Sarah comes out of the tent. Father of multitudes, the dinner is ready. Abraham responding to her, I'm coming, mother of multitudes, thank you. Any servant under them most likely were like, (laughs) they totally lost it. Totally lost it. Just try to picture them introducing themselves to somebody else. Oh, hi, how you doing? My my name is Father of Multitudes. This is my wife, the Mother of Multitudes. (laughs) If I'm the one saying hi, I would say, excuse me, where where are the multitudes? (laughs) I don't see them. But that's what Abraham did. Against all hope, he had hope. And he believed for it. Because the only thing that we cannot lose is our hope. Hope is is like an anchor that holds us together inside of the throne of God. It's like like if you were holding to a rope and the afflictions come and one strand starts breaking and then the next strand and then the next strand and then there's only one little tiny strand holding you together. That little one is what is called hope. That in the midst of all the afflictions and everything, still there's a God that can do something in your circumstance. Don't lose your hope. You can't lose your hope. Tell the person next to you, you can't lose your hope. Israel, the people of Israel had seen God's glory and power in so many levels. Yet they complain about God about everything. In Egypt, because they doubled the labor, when finally they got out of 
Egypt and they were in the middle of the Exodus, they complained because the Red Sea was in front of them. Oh, we're going to die. What are we going to do? In the desert because there was no water. Then because there was no bread. Then because there was no meat. But the last strand, the last little thing happened right in front of the promised land. When they had it right in front, they could see it, probably even smell it. And they heard that night that the people in the land were like giants. And the people of Israel were looking most likely like grasshopper in their own eyes. That night, they lost something you and I cannot lose. And it's our hope. That night, what happened was that the entire nation... Starting to cry, started to cry. All the nation was crying. The elders were crying. The soldiers were crying. The women, the children, everyone was crying and crying. And it was loud. Any person walking into that camp that night would have said exactly the same thing. They lost their hope. But what we, see from, what we see from David is totally the opposite. In the midst of all these circumstances, his declaration was, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Because we can't lose our hope. Something similar happened to David and his 400 men. He wasn't a king yet. But he was fighting the battles of Israel because he loved God and his people on the side without being noticed. And one day he went out to battle with his 400 people. And when they came back, the camp was all on fire. The women weren't there anymore. The children weren't there anymore. The cattle, everything they owned was gone. And these men, men of war, that had probably fought the craziest battles at that point, that had probably overcome every circumstance and situation and probably seen death in front of their own eyes so many days, that had enemies starting all the way up from the king of Israel, started to cry and cry and cry like babies. They became bitter and angry and they channelized all that bitterness and anger towards the man of God, David. Sounds like something that still happens nowadays. When we're in issues and in trouble, we want to blame the pastor or the leader or the teacher, the coach, the mentor. Anybody seen those men of war bowling, crying the way they were would have said the same thing. They lost their hope. In the, second king, in the second book of Kings, we see the story of Samaria. The land was in the middle of a horrible famine. People were starving. And on top of that, the Syrian army had come and encamped all around them, so they were enclosed. And the hunger was so bad that they started to eat the heads of a donkey. And they were selling those for 80 pieces of silver. They were also eating bird poop and selling it for four pieces of silver. And it got so horrible that they started eating their own babies. And at that specific point, the king of Samaria tore his garments and said, enough, I'm going to kill Elisha. Because most likely Elisha, the prophet, was encouraging the people, let's wait on God. Let's wait on the Lord. He still can do something. But that night he had enough and he said, I'm going to kill the man of God. He lost what you and I can never lose, which is our hope. But I came to tell you this morning, you may be in affliction. You may have all the odds against you this morning. You may have all the troubles on top of you and the people that are actually, the only person that can actually help you is not willing to help you. 
Maybe you have lost everything in your life. I came to tell you this morning, there is still one person that can do something. So I came to tell you, do not lose your hope. And I came to remind the church of people of God promises. The first one is in the book of Lamentation. And this is what the Bible says. The Lord is good to those who wait in him. He is good to those who wait in him. God is a good God and nobody can change that. And he says, I am good to those who wait in me. And the second thing he said, no one who hopes in him will ever be put to shame. It is good to wait in the Lord because he is good to those who do so. And they will never be put to shame, declares the Lord. He is the promise keeper, not me. He is the one that is declaring today, it is good for you to wait in me because I am good to those who do so. It is good to believe because I will never put you to shame. That is the promise that God is telling the church this morning. In the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of what's happening, he can still do something. David at that point when all his men wanted to kill him, instead of crying with them and just staying in that low place, the Bible said that he strengthened himself on the Lord. And he grabbed the priest and he consulted God. And he said, God, what do I do? And God said, and the word of God came to that priest and he said, go and chase your enemies because you will surely overtake him and recover everything you have lost. That is the God we have. When we hold on to our hope, the same thing happened in Samaria. Elijah most likely was the one preaching hope that time. And the king, when the king wanted to kill him and he actually came to kill him, the word of the Lord came upon Elisha. And he looked at the king and said, tomorrow the prices of all the food in Samaria will come to regular prices. The, tomorrow there will be abundance in the kingdom. That same night, that same night, not the day after, not a week after, that same night they went out and somehow supernaturally the army of Syria had heard that a huge army was coming to kill them. I know what that huge army is. It's the kingdom of heaven. And when they heard that, they had to go. And the people of Samaria came out and said, look at all this plunder. God had worked in our favor because God is good to those who wait on him. And he will never put them to shame. Thank you, Jesus. The last promise I want to remind you this morning. I don't know what your circumstances are, but this is what God promised in the book of Zechariah. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Prisoners of what? Hope. Prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. How much? Double. How much? Double. God is not a cheap God, guys. God will never give you back exactly what you lost. And that is sad news for the devil because he's going to need to empty his pockets because God says double. He didn't say, he didn't say just a little bit. He said double. Wasn't that what happened to Job? In the midst of his misery, he declared, even if he kills me, I will still hope in him. And the last chapter says that hope, it says that, and the Lord restored to Job lo Job's losses when he restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Because God says double, not just a little bit, double. That is exactly what happened to Mordecai. Mordecai, the one that came to talk to his knees, when he finally, when his declaration was still holding to that hope, God defeated all of his enemies. And from the little low place he was, as one of the little tiny servants, he was set as the second man in command in the kingdom. Double. Double is what God says. He doesn't say just a little. The same thing happened to David. When all his bodies were all sad and he heard the word of the Lord, go and overtake your, your enemies, he went over there and recovered everything that was their own, plus a huge plunder from that army that we were carrying with them that David ended up giving to all of his people. Double is what God promises, guys.
I don't know who's excited this morning about that, but I am. I am. Because God says double. It is good. It is good to wait in the Lord because He is good to those who wait in Him. They will never be put to shame. They will never be put to shame. And as I, don't under, I don't know what your circumstances are today. I don't know what you're dealing with. Maybe you say, Jose, I'm in my last strength. I'm in my last strength, man. That last strength is called hope. And when we hope in God, He is good to those who hope in Him. I came with good news this morning, church. Maybe you lost everything. Maybe the diagnosis over your life, your relative, or the people you love is irrevocable. Maybe the people that can actually help you can and are not willing to do it. Maybe all the odds are against you. But I came to tell you, do not lose your hope. Hold on to that little last string and don't let go because God said it is good. He is good to those who wait in Him. He will never put them to shame. And He promises double. David was in a horrible place, probably carrying shame, sadness, his family away, his wife away in a land that wasn't his land. Wait on the Lord, he declared. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I want to finish with a little bit of my story. Some of you have heard some of it already. But when I was 13 years old, I lost my daddy in a car accident. Probably the age where a kid needs his daddy the most. And it was his birthday. The party was set with presents and relatives waiting for him. And he never made it home because of a car accident. That same year, I met Jesus. And I gave him my life. And I said, I'm going to trust in you. But years after, I lost my hope. And I went away. And everything fell apart in my life. But he had mercy over me once again. And I ended up living in the house of a pastor. A Christian, Christian preacher. That hold me like his own son. Taught me like his own son. And he, he encouraged me and influenced my life so much. That when I finished college, I went straight to ministry college because all I wanted to do was to serve the Lord. So I did. And I served in his church for two years. And when I thought that everything was in place and good and looking fine, everything was falling apart. Every door was closed for me. I was in the most confusing time of my life. And I had to move to America to try to breathe because I couldn't even breathe. And when my idea was to study English four months here and go back, in my knees at LSU in one of the dorms, I said, God, I am almost 30 years old. And here I am having to start over from zero. But you know what? I trust you. And I hold on to that little last string. And I was holding there. And God opened the doors for me. Two masters at LSU for free. Then he gave me a job that led me to another job, to a better job. He gave me a wife. He gave me beautiful kids. And he sent me nowadays here to serve you guys best job a man could ever dream of is serving God maybe your story maybe your story is way harder than mine maybe your story is way crazier and difficult to even believe but I came to tell you this morning is the same God is the same God who deal with me whom I hold and held on to is the same one that can transform your situation and your affliction 
the only thing we need to do is what John Wesley was saying. If you just lift up your eyes above those afflictions, you will see the one that has an answer for your affliction. The one that can transform your life. The one that makes a way where there is no way. The one that brings a river when you feel dry like nothing else in this earth. The one that can transform and bring whatever you're asking for, a wife, a husband, kids, a situation, healing in your life. He can do it because His name is Jesus and He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? I know God has been speaking to several people this morning. And I don't know how many of you have been trying to just put that impossible under the rug so you don't have to see it again. But God is calling the church to believe in the impossible today. He can do it. If you've been waiting in Him, way to go. Because He is good to those who wait in Him. And He will never put them to shame. Maybe you're here saying, man, where is all the prophecy that I got about my life? All the words that people had spoken to me. I came to tell you, He is good to those who wait in Him. He will never put them to shame. He wants to do it with you. And if you say today, may I need an injection of hope this morning. I need somebody to pray with me, to pray over me, to agree with me. You know what Jesus said? Again, I say to you, again, I say to you, must be pretty important. That if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. God prepared this Sunday for you. For that impossible that you've been believing for. They're waiting for. God prepared this Sunday for you to come and agree with somebody here in our prayer team and say, let's believe for that once again. Let's hope in the Lord that He can do it with us again. So I'm going to ask the prayer team to come quickly, quickly, quickly to the, to the front. Because God prepared this moment for those who are in that condition. I don't know what you've been dreaming for or asking for or believing for. The circumstance doesn't matter because God is the same God. And today I want to encourage you, as Jesus said, agree with somebody. Two of you can make it happen. The Father can make it happen. If that is you and you say, man, this message is hitting home this morning. Come over. Don't lose this opportunity. This Sunday God prepared it for you. As we jump into worship, feel free to respond. Father, thank you for every heart in this place. Take us to the place of believing that you are the God of the impossible. Thank you because you are good to those who wait in you. And they will never be put to shame. Thank you because you have doubled whatever the devil has been trying to steal from us. God, I pray every heart that has been uh, spoken to, would you bring him to the altar? Don't miss this opportunity in every family it's represented in this place, in every man, in every woman. In Jesus' name, the Spirit of God, freely tonight, today. In Jesus' name, amen.